From the WKYT studios in Lexington, this is Kentucky Newsmakers with Bill Bryant. Good morning, I'm Bill Bryant, and we welcome you in to Kentucky Newsmakers from WKYT and hope you're having a nice weekend. We have a couple of timely topics for you today as we're in the Christmas holiday season. Later, the president of the United Way of the Bluegrass talks about how human needs are being met and the big challenges that remain in poverty, health, and education. But first, an encouraging trend, highway deaths in Kentucky are down for the year, and we could be on pace to have fewer deaths than we have had in a, some 40 years or so. Kentucky State Police say there are several factors for that improvement. Law enforcement is tougher, medical personnel are faster and better, road designs are improved, and cars are safer as well. And not to be overlooked, drivers, it seems, are being more and more careful these days. Joined today by Sergeant Michael Webb and Trooper Brad Arterburn to talk about that as well as efforts to recruit some new troopers to the force. Gentlemen, thanks for coming. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Sergeant, first, uh, any fatalities, of course, are too many. We yes. know that. But being realistic, uh, we are seeing some pretty encouraging trends on the highway right now, aren't we? I tell you what, we at the Kentucky State Police have seen a really, really good trend in the last several years. When I came on as a trooper just uh, uh, in 2003, we were in a, a thousand range of fatalities a year. Thankfully, last year we were at an all-time low uh, since 1949, which is a, a great feat for the Commonwealth to be at such a low number of fatalities and deaths on our highways. Thankfully, this year we're actually at a lower number at this point now than we were last year. We had 602 persons that had died on our roadways last year at this point. Right now we have 595. So we're already seven better than we were than our best year since 1949 last year now. Um, and we're going to be out focusing on several key behaviors that we believe really contribute to fatalities on our roadway, such as driving while impaired, not wearing a seatbelt, excessive speed, and reckless driving. That would include texting and distracted driving as well. What do we believe are the factors uh, in this good improvement that we have seen? Well, there's, there's several things that could really go into the, the overall picture, the totality of the circumstances why we're doing so much better. The engineering of vehicles, as you alluded to in your opening, is definitely a big factor of that. Road design is a big factor of that. We've been able to change a lot of hot spots where there are fatalities. But also, it's, there's education components that the Kentucky State Police and our local law enforcement partners across the Commonwealth are doing to educate different groups of, of society. Uh, a lot of those are in schools with younger children, with teenagers, which tend to be a lot of the fatalities, unfortunately. And then we also have our enforcement eff efforts, which we step up at this time of the year because we know that there are a lot more folks traveling on the roadways, just like we had in Thanksgiving. There's going to be more traveling for the Christmas holiday as well. And we're really going to focus on those behaviors, such as driving while impaired. That's a big one this time of the year. Sadly, a lot of folks will make a very poor decision to get in a vehicle while under the influence, and they could take their own life or lives of other innocent motorists on the road. And that's something we're going to be out there looking very specifically for, plus not wearing a seatbelt. Last year, 254 people died while not wearing a seatbelt in crashes. That's such a simple way to prevent death by just clicking the seatbelt. We also had 153 crashes that involved alcohol, another very senseless tragedy in which we have to go and provide a death notification to some family that someone has lost their life on the roadway, and that's something that nobody wants. And something I'm, I'm sure you've done in your career. Unfortunately, uh, all too many times. That's a very sad day. Are there ways that, uh, that we can make our roads even safer? Well, there's, there's definitely things that we could do. We work with the, the legislature and the road department all the time on improving roadways. And uh, uh, we have automakers call us, and we give them suggestions as well on things. But really, the main thing is increasing our educational efforts in the schools and with highway safety messages and utilizing our resources at the local level and the Kentucky State Police for enforcement efforts. A lot of times what we will do is we will concentrate our efforts based upon the data that we have at hand. We have a program at the Kentucky State Police called the Data Driven Enforcement Plan where we collect data from our criminal intelligence analysts and, intel and intelligence analysts in the field to find out where all the crashes are happening, the time of day, uh, the certain road, um, certain location in a certain town, and we allocate our resources specifically to look for those hot spots, those times of day, have the right troopers working to, to match the manpower with the need, if you will. 
Trooper Brad Arterburn is uh, now heading up a recruitment for Kentucky State Police, and uh, I know that you're recruiting some troopers right now. Uh, what do you tell people about the opportunity to join the th thin gray line? Well, it's a great opportunity. Uh, doesn't come around too often. You know, we don't have classes a lot. Maybe once a year we'll have classes. So uh, when we do open up a class, we try to get the word out as much as possible. Uh, right now we're taking applications. Uh, our application deadline is December 31st, so still got a few weeks left, but we don't want people to wait until the last minute to try to get it in. Have to spend, you know, $50 to try to mail something in overnight. You know, take your time. There's a little bit of paperwork with it. Um, but we just want, we want good people. Uh, you know, we're looking for hardworking people who are dedicated, who have what it takes. You know, this is a job that uh, isn't for everyone, uh, but there are a lot of people out there uh, that we could use. You know, we, we want more people. We're happy to have the numbers. We want more all the time. What are the minimum requirements uh, for uh, a trooper candidate? Few requirements. Uh, one, they need to be 21 years old. Uh, no felonies on their record. Um, the three main things we look at are they need to either have 60 hours of college credit or two years prior active duty military service or two years prior law enforcement service. Any one of those three, doesn't have to be all three, any one of those three you can apply to Kentucky State Police. Do you find it challenging to find uh, candidates uh, who are qualified to make it through the process? We do. Um, you look at uh, the times we're in right now, the stories you see on the news every night, it is a challenging time to find people who want to be in law enforcement. And then the Kentucky State Police is an elite agency. Our training uh, is, is tough. Um, but so when we get people, they have to be dedicated to that process because if you're not 100% dedicated to being a Kentucky State Trooper, you're not going to make it through. And it happens every year. We have a very high attrition rate because of our tough training. And uh, so we need people who are really dedicated and motivated to be troopers. Your reference to uh, things people have been seeing in the news, uh, what has changed in the recruiting for law enforcement since the events of the summer, say, in Ferguson, Missouri? Well, people realize you know, everything we do is going to be scrutinized. Uh, you know, for a long time, uh, law enforcement, you went out, you did your job, you went home at night, you know, there, there went on to it, but cell phones, uh, with cameras that we have, everything is captured now for, for good and for bad. Um, but so a lot of people um, don't want that to where every aspect of their life is going to be scrutinized. Every detail that they do in their job is going to be looked at. Some people don't want that stress level because it does cause stress sometimes amongst the things we do. But, uh, you know, we, we try to tell people that you do your job the right way and you're going to be okay. And uh, to what extent, uh, to either of you, in, in <clears throat> recruiting minority candidates to be uh, members of the Kentucky State Police, is that uh, challenging in Kentucky where the metropolitan areas basically are Lexington and Louisville? And it is a challenge yeah. for us. It's one that we've been working on for some time, uh, long before recent events in the media. We've been trying to find folks that uh, minorities and females and, and other folks that we uh, would like to have more numbers of in our agency. Uh, and it is just difficult due to the nature of the job that we do and a lot of the folks that um, what we would be able to pull in from minorities will end up going to a larger metropolitan area because that's where they want to live. Uh, there's uh, a lot more conveniences in the city and things like that where our troopers may be out in rural areas uh, far away from where they're from. So there are some challenges that we have to go through but we are certainly working through those trying our best to recruit as many good qualified candidates as we can. I mean, either of you would acknowledge uh, you, it's a, a special breed of person who is going to go out there and many times those rural areas knowing that backup is a long way away and, uh, and handle uh, tough circumstances. Well, the, the Kentucky State Police Trooper's job is, is very unique. It's very different from that of other local law enforcement agencies, specifically those in the city. We are working uh, alone covering large geographical areas in rural areas where there are not a lot of other local law enforcement. Uh, perhaps one of our most useful, uh, where we use the most is in rural areas where there's not a lot of tax base and industry to fund a police department or sheriff's department. So we are used and we cover a lot of areas we don't have backup. So it takes a very specific type of person to want to be a trooper. And we have a lot of folks that come that apply who want a job. Then we have folks who want to be a police officer, but we're looking for the ones who want to be a trooper, which is a very specific skill set and very specific mindset. Um, and we, we're trying to get those folks, qualified candidates, minorities, women, uh, that we would like to have do those jobs. And we have uh, some very good minorities and females serving our agency very, very uh, 
well today. Simple website to reach uh, for more information? Absolutely. KentuckyStatePolice.org. All right. Spelled very out. good. Gentlemen, thank you for coming in and uh, good luck with, with the recruiting efforts and certainly keeping our highway safe. We appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. And we're back in just a moment with Bill Farmer from the United Way of the Bluegrass coming next on Kentucky Newsmakers. And welcome back into Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. It's the season of giving, but as we know, there are year-round needs in Kentucky that continue. The United Way of the Bluegrass recently announced a major goal of having 10,000 more bluegrass families self-sufficient by 2020. You may not know how many areas the United Way touches through human service organizations, and it's not always just money. The United Way is also interested in finding volunteers who can be mentors or help carry out projects to meet special needs. Bill Farmer is the president of the United Way. He spent years as an executive before moving to Lexington and seeing that it's a beautiful place, but there are still lots of challenges. Bill, good to see you. Thanks for coming. It's good to be here. Appreciate Happy very New much. Year and, and hope you have a great holiday. Well, same to you. Uh, the economy is growing uh, and improving. We can now see that, uh, obviously. Uh, many people are beginning to build some wealth again, and they are giving again, according to the reports across the country. But you say not always in the areas where uh, the area here needs, uh, needs to receive it. Well, I think that what's happening is that we're experiencing an increase in charitable giving back to pre-2008, before the recession. Where the issue and concern is, is that people really aren't investing as much in health and human services. They're investing and donating money in, at colleges and universities. In fact, my alma mater received just yesterday a $100 million uh, donation. So you're seeing those kinds of donations to colleges, universities, museums, et cetera, but not really with arts, excuse me, health and human services. And I think where the difference is, is that in health and human services, we generally are looking at working class and middle class consumers investing, and they don't feel nearly as comfortable with the economy as those who have significant wealth. So what would you have people know about the uh, continuing needs? Well, I think that the needs are always great. Um, we're very focused on ensuring that people have the basic needs during this time of the year. I think that what we really need to start focusing on is how we address long-term issues and concerns. Uh, I mean, clearly, this time of the year, we need to make sure that if people are homeless or hungry, that we make sure that they have a warm, safe place for them to sleep, make sure they have a warm meal. The real key is how do we as a community decide to help them ensure that that doesn't happen next year this time? Mm -hmm. uh, you have said that poverty should never be a reason of why people don't succeed, yet we know it's obviously a, a barrier to, uh, to many unless there is uh, some kind of intervention. What kinds of programs can you tell us about that, uh, that are supported by the United Way that have uh, bridged that gap or made a difference in sure. lives? Sure. Well, we have a program called Count Me In. So if someone calls 211 and say either I'm unemployed or underemployed, the United Way funds agencies that provide job training programs. Let's assume the person gets a job. It, we also have a program that in, in helps people get and uh, earn a checking account. Assuming they have the checking account, we also prepare taxes for free. And if you need to acquire an asset, for instance, to get additional education or to return, so you return to school, or you need uh, to become an entrepreneur or return to school, we actually will help you with that. So what that does is it allows people to understand where their statue and status of life is. But if they want to improve the United Way can have system, and it's called Count Me In. So if any of your viewers see 211 and say, Count Me In, mm -hmm. we can help them put them on a program. And tell us about some of the agencies that United Way helps provide support for. Sure. Well, agencies this time of the year, uh, one of the most important, of course, is Salvation Army. Yeah. Uh, but we also support the NEST at this time of the year from the standpoint of, of people needing additional assistance. We actually support 80 agencies and 140 programs. So there are significant numbers of agencies and programs that we work on. What have been your impressions since you uh, came to Lexington? I know uh, some years ago, you, you uh, five years ago, when you walked in the door, you said this is a beautiful place, uh, and I keep hearing that there are challenges. As you have peeled back and, and seen more and more, uh, what what are your perceptions? I think at this particular point, our largest challenge is how do we ensure that we have equitable education for all students in schools? Um, and let's talk a little bit about Fayette County Public Schools. Uh, in Fayette County Public Schools, 29 of the 51 schools have been rated by the state as needs improvement. 
So that is a significant concern for us. It is not an indictment on the teachers or the administrators or the principals. It is, an, it is just an issue that we need to address collectively as a community. And what are some ways that you can get at that, that achievement gap? Well, one of the ways that we at the United Way really focus on is providing more volunteers. Uh, we think that the average citizen who wants to make sure that kids are getting a better opportunity for education, if they're willing to volunteer some of their time, and helping teaching kids how to read or teaching them math, that would be a major assistance to those particular students and to the teachers. And if somebody is interested in that, can they uh, receive a, a training? Or, or, or Absolutely. Say, yeah, tell the, me about that. Well, we have training. We have programs in Anderson, Clark, Scott, and Woodford counties that uh -huh. we have had in place for four years, and it's the Trailblazers program. And if anyone is interested in those, in that kind of uh, mentoring and tutoring, dial 211, and we can direct you to those particular initiatives. We're now launching a program at William Wells Brown Elementary School, which is, and many of your viewers may be aware, is the worst rated elementary school in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and it's located right here in, in Lexington. And we're recruiting volunteers to help. At this point, we have over 70 volunteers who are prepared the 1st of January to go in and provide assistance to teachers. If somebody walks in and says they think they can make a difference, uh, what uh, opportunities would they, would they have to, to go in and help in a situation uh, like uh, William Wells Brown or some of these other schools? Well, the three things that we ask people to consider is their time, their talent, and their treasure. So their time would be volunteering, their talent would be skills that they bring that are unique, that they can assist in helping anyone in the community, and of course their uh, treasure would be providing funding to these initiatives. You know, the interesting thing that as we've worked with volunteers, volunteers are free, but the management of the volunteers isn't free. And so in order to ensure that there's a great positive relationship between the volunteer and the student, we have to make sure that there are what we call infrastructure. There's programs and process in place. Just showing up at a school and expecting things to work well doesn't work. Yeah, so they then, you know, what are some components of this training that they receive to be good volunteers? Well, I think the, the first one is understanding what you can and cannot do, how to talk with kids to make sure that you don't end up alienating. And sometimes you can, you can have the best of intentions and end up making situations worse. So there's training that teaches you how to talk effectively with kids, what you can and cannot say or do. Um, but again, I think most of it is that, and I'll give you an example. If I am in the first grade and I, am, and I don't know how to read well, being able to work with that student on a one-on-one -on -one basis and work with them on their letters, work with them on their reading skills, it doesn't take a lot of training, but it does take some time. Are there some unusual matches that, uh, you know, it's like surprising that maybe this uh, grandfather uh, walks in and, and helps this uh, six or seven year old? Uh, sure. Yeah. And in fact, there's one at Yates Elementary School yeah. and it's Mr. Bills. And Mr. Bills is a 75 year old, I'm assuming grandfather, who really invests a lot of time in the school. He becomes very emotional when he talks about the relationship that he has with the students there. And something as simple as trying to make sure that kids are not on timeout is important. And sometimes people don't realize that it's the simpler things that you can do. Let's just look at it from this standpoint. From kindergarten through the third grade, you learn to read. From the fourth grade on, you read to learn. And so if you don't have great learning skills and reading skills by the third grade, so if we could have volunteers work with kindergartners through the third grade and, and emulate Mr. Bills, that would be great for us and great for the community. You've been aggressive also in trying to galvanize executives and others, uh, to uh, people of means, to, to help out. D do you find your service area is eager to respond when people uh, see the needs identified and uh, clearly laid out as far as what the goals are and what the results might be? I think so, but I think the difference is that this is the first time in many cases that we've had these conversations. When I talk with people and tell them that 29 of the 51 schools in Fayette County are rated as needs improvement. For many of them, this is the first time they've ever heard this kind of story. And so we need to make sure that we're communicating better. But out of what you probably are referencing is what we call the CEO Summit. Yeah. Uh, Paul Rook, the chairman and, and president of Lexmark, and I conducted a CEO Summit and invited the top business leaders in the area. And what we did is we also, we've had, <coughs> excuse me, 
Cincinnati Bell from Cincinnati come in and talk about how they adopted Taft High School in Cincinnati. 12 years ago, Taft High School had an 18% graduation rate. Now it's 90% plus. And so we're able to see how the business community and others can become more engaged. Out of that, we created what we call the Bluegrass Promise. And the Bluegrass Promise simply says, collectively as a community, business community, nonprofit community, uh, the faith community, college students, we collectively as a community are going to do every single thing that we can to make sure that every child has a quality public education. Have uh, you seen that uh, uh, as you peel back and people see how interconnected the community really is, that uh, those who might invest, might help, might give of their time, uh, can realize that they really can improve the community overall? Absolutely. You know, interesting thing, and, and we use as an analogy, that when we take a look at specifically the percentage of kids who are receiving free or reduced lunch, in Fayette County, 54% of the kids are on free or reduced lunch. And our projection is that by 2020, 64 percent of the kids will be on reduced lunch unless there's some intervention or some intervening actions. Poverty should never be the reason for poor academic performance, but it does require some intervention and that's why the volunteers are important working with the schools, recognizing that the short-term answer is the volunteers. The long-term solution is that kids need to graduate from high school college or career ready so they can make a family sustainable wage, All a right. living wage. With Bill Farmer of the United Way of the Bluegrass, we're back in just a moment with some ways you can help. And whether this big, bold goal is realistic, we're back on Kentucky Newsmakers in a moment. Welcome back into Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. Our remaining moments with Bill Farmer, who's president of the United Way of the Bluegrass. And he's going to tell us something about a program called the Big Bold Goal for 2020. And you compare that to the BBN, you said. Absolutely. The, the BBG, the Big Bold Goal, is a derivative of Big Blue Nation. One of the things that I've learned is that this is a very competitive community. It's a very competitive re region. And what we've tried to do is to communicate our message in a way that fits with the community and with the region. One of the questions that, that we ask ourselves is this. If Coach Cal were the superintendent of Fayette County Public Schools, or if Coach Cal were the president of the United Way, what would be the, the expectations of performance? So the same expectations that we have of the basketball team, we ought to have for health and human services concerns. Does that connect? Absolutely it does, because I think it, it really fits into the model. I mean, think about it. If we were to go into a, one of our communities in which a significant number of kids are receiving free or reduced lunch, and we're on a, on a playground, we would assume if we randomly chose five kids, that all of them could play basketball. The question is, would we make the same assumption that all of them could be good students? And what's happened is that we've developed a system where we, are not have, we don't have high expectations for all students. Coach Cal has high expectations not only academically and athletically for his students, student athletes, we ought to have the same for all of the students in our school districts. And so your goal uh, by the year 2020 is to make a, a big difference through this. Absolutely. We have both short-term and long-term. I talk with our Count Me In program where we're working on short-term initiatives and our long-term is in the area of education. Uh, let's talk about this very quickly. Uh, here, as, as people are asked to uh, you know, open their, their wallets, their pocketbooks and, and assist the United Way, which then assists all of these other agencies in addition to its own programs, uh, how can they be certain that there is accountability uh, for that money that they are putting out there? Excellent question. We've developed a relationship with the University of Kentucky and, and UK analyzes all of our work. And every six months, the university issues a report or findings on how well we're doing in meeting outcomes, how dollars are spent. That information is placed on our website. So if, if you as a donor or an investor in the community through the United Way, want to know how the dollars are being spent, all you have to do is go to our website and it will tell you by dollar, whether it's an internal program or external program, how we're utilizing the money. It is true transparency and accountability. Can people earmark their contributions for a particular uh, agency or area of, uh, if they want to do that? Sure, they can designate, but our preference is not to have our clients or donors designate because we look at data and information to determine how we should spend the money. And so in absence of that kind of review by the, the donor, 
they would maybe making a random choice. If people are interested and they want to help or they want to, uh, to donate, uh, how do they get more information? Uh, what, uh, would you, what would be your call to action here at the holidays? Well, my call to action is to have people go to www.uwbg.org and utilize their credit card to, um, or call United Way through 211 and say, I want to donate to the United Way and have that donation be provided to agencies in our community. Payroll deductions are and still pay, an important part? Payroll deductions are still important. Uh, so if you're in a, uh, an office that has a workplace campaign, that's still an opportunity for you to participate. If you're in an office that doesn't have a workplace campaign, if you're willing to take the lead, we will work with you and ask your boss if we can run a campaign for your particular location. All right. Thank you so much for coming in. We appreciate it very Thank much. Thank you, and hope you have a great holiday. And same to you. Appreciate it very much. Bill Farmer from United Way of the Bluegrass. I want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Kentucky Newsmakers. I'll see you bright and early this week on WKYT This Morning. We start at 4.30 a.m. We're bright and early with the latest news, weather, traffic, and sports on mid-morning at 10 and on WKYT News at noon. And we hope you make it a good week ahead.